Hello folks, welcome to Scratch the Surface, I'm E.J. Scott. Today my guest is Fred Melamed, character actor extraordinaire. You've seen him in several things, I'm sure. He has almost 100 uh, credits, acting credits on IMDb. Uh, we talked about a lot of stuff. Before I get into what we talked about, check me out online on Twitter at E.J. Scott and at E.J. Podcast. Instagram at E.J. Scott 1106. Uh, my website is ejscott.com, and uh, there's a documentary about me called Running Blind on iTunes, Amazon, and Google Play. It's a digital copies uh, only of the movie um, called Running Blind. It's about me running 12 marathons in 12 states in 2012 blindfolded because I am going blind, and uh, run, it runs in my family. I have an eye disease called choroideremia. And I'm legally blind right now, and uh, I'm always looking to raise awareness and money to uh, to go towards a treatment or a cure. Um, so that's what I did in 2012. And you can, for two or three dollars, you can rent or buy a digital copy, and uh, it's only 30 minutes long, so it's well worth your time and money. And uh, it's a interesting story, and you get to see all the crazy stuff I did in uh, 2012. And it's also, uh, it's very entertaining. Um, uh, my friend Ryan Suffern edited, edited and directed it. So uh, check that out and uh, thank you if you do. Um, also, uh, be sure to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes and iHeartRadio. Please leave a review and a rating on iTunes. Uh, I'm starting to push for that stuff now. Uh, because I never really pushed much on uh, ratings and reviews before. But please, if you can, rate and review the podcast. Thank you. All right, so Fred came over and talked to me about a lot of stuff. Um, he's a father of twins who have autism. Um, we talk about uh, his work with Woody Allen and his opinion about what has happened to Woody Allen in terms of uh, the accusations that uh, has been made against Woody Allen. Um, Fred's worked on a lot of stuff. Uh, we talk about marriage and we talk about all his uh, working with the Cohen brothers. Um, so much to talk about with Fred. We had a great time. I hope you'll enjoy listening to it. This is from July 5th, 2018. Enjoy my talk with Fred Melamed. So I, since I don't know the the, the uh, tenor of the podcast, yeah. are you free to talk about anything? Or yeah. do you, okay, great. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you have a great tenor, <laughs> so it's perfect. <laughs> I've been thinking specifically. I was thinking all this morning about uh, sexual politics in Hollywood and power and all that kind of stuff. Oh yeah. Okay. Well, you want I mean, we'll, have, we'll see what we'll happens. Start there. <laughs> well, I'll start wherever you want to start. If you want to start with stuff that's more personal to me, I'm happy to talk about that. Whatever you want to do. Yeah, well, well, well just out of curiosity, we'll, we'll, we'll start right now. This is Hi, Fred. Hi. <laughs> what were you just thinking about? The sexual uh, politics was, I, I, in Hollywood? Yeah, I was thinking on, on my way over here about... Um, let me preface this yeah. by saying that uh, there's absolutely no question that... Uh, the Me Too movement is rightful and is necessary. Uh, and I have no, I mean, I think any, any reasonable person who, who assesses the situation honestly knows that women have gotten the shitty end of the stick in our world in general for thousands of years. No, since the beginning of man. Really. Yeah, pretty much, I guess. And, and certainly in our business... Uh, where uh, the bastions of power have been male pretty much for until very recently, you know, from the beginning of the business, the brief hundred years or so that we've had this business. Uh, and also particularly where youth, beauty, aesthetic uh, appeal is valued uh, sort of, un, uh, you know, unequally for men and women, although it's, still, although it's, well, it's valued for all, it's, cer it's certainly... Uh, um, you know, the pressure towards that is greater on women. Um, uh, th that has made the playing field, uh, to call it uneven, is the most, you know, laughable understatement. Right. Um, that said, what's interesting to me 
is that in human nature in general, the sad fact of human nature is that any oppressed class of people, or even oppressed individuals, when they reach something like parity with their oppressors, or at least they have a leg up towards the power of their oppressors, instead of wanting to be free of the whole paradigm and saying, you know, fuck this, I don't, this is not fair, this is not right, this is not the way it should be, what usually winds up happening is the oppressor has a deep need to play the other role, hmm. to see what it's like, to experience, not, to, not for experimental reasons, but a deeper-seated need than that, to know what it's like to be the one that has the power. That's, sure, why, that's sure. why children who are abused yeah. very often <clears throat> wind up right. repeating it. You know, since you mentioned that, um, I used to, I've watched, ever watched that Scared Straight mm -hmm. TV show? Mm -hmm. Um, and a lot of those troubled kids, when they, when they're asked, what do you want to be when you grow up? Almost all of them say a cop or, uh, a parole, you know, somebody, somebody with power, mm -hmm. somebody with power, even though they're already bullies, they want to, they want to take that and, and become like bigger bullies. Yeah. They want to be bullies who are sanctioned by something greater than, 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 you know, just the power of their muscles. They yeah. want to be a bully where it's okay to be a bully. Yeah. That's sort of yeah. part of the job. So, and also, I mean, you know, I hear a lot of what's, what people are talking about in the business and particularly women who have been vocal, understandably vocal. Yeah. And there's such ubiquitous praise and, 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 and reinforcement of women playing so-called strong roles. I want to play a strong woman. I want to play a woman who's heroic. I want to play strength. As a male actor, if I said, I want to play strong men. Mm -hmm. I want to play men who are heroic. Mm -hmm. I want to play men who are just strong. Mm -hmm. Well, there might be men who feel that way. It might be actors who feel that way. But uh, I, I would say those are actors who are apt to give boring performances in boring roles. Mm. What makes human beings interesting is the dichotomy of forces within them. Sure. Right? That's what, that's what as, as an actor, you look for. I'm not saying that, oh, I like playing milk toasty roles. Certainly not. Um, but what's interesting about playing an evil character is to find what's noble in the character's mm -hmm. nature and what's good about, interesting about playing characters who are heroic or framed in heroic situations is seeing what in them is not heroic. Right. Right? So th this constant, you know, thing that you hear of, I want to play strong characters, need, we need more strong characters. I, I, it's totally understandable to me that women don't want to play characters who are seen in the context of male relationships, which is what winds up happening. You know, you have women that are secondary to the story, their girlfriends, their wives, their... Damsels in distress. Right. Yeah. Whores, you know, all the usual yeah. t uh, uh, tropes. That's probably what they mean is like, we don't want those to play those characters anymore. Yeah, want they, want to be they want to be protagonists. Yeah, they want some meat on the bones too. And yeah. I think antagonists too, you know. I oh yeah, or antagonists. Just something but some people who are important... Uh, that, that that don't they're, they're essentially not character roles to yeah. to, to, to cliches yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, but, but people who this whom the story is about yeah you know their experience their lives is about which I understand but I mean it's interesting to me I mean you look at a guy like Harvey Weinstein and I, I admittedly I'm saying you know a, I. I Never knew Harry Weinstein very well. I met him. I hardly right. knew him. But I know. But I'm in a business where he was an icon for years and years and constantly interacted with people who interacted with him. Now, here's a guy who, with the power and money that he had, and by the way, for people who don't understand this, who might not be in the business, People say, well, why did you deal with a prick like Harvey Weinstein? Harvey Weinstein positioned himself so that if he wanted to be in certain kinds of movies, movies that were apt to be more interesting, that were apt to be more uh, in the Oscar milieu, they were apt to be more the kinds of projects that most people want to work on, mm -hmm. he made himself pretty much the gate through which you had to pass. You know, he, he and his company, Miramax. Yeah. You, it was very difficult to go to find prestigious, interesting projects without passing through that gate, and he set yeah. that up. Yeah. He and his he and his his cohort set that up. Yeah. But look at a guy like him, 
who, with the money and power and everything else that he had, if a question was about sex, could have had all the sex that a human being could sure. t- tolerate yeah. with people who would be more than happy to provide it for him, either for money, as people do professionally, and or a beautiful wife. He had a beautiful wife too. I guess. I mean, I, I, I'm, you know, I, 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 I doubt that she knew what he was up to to the extent no, that th- th- that he was. But yeah, uh, but uh, even outside marriage, I mean, he and and plenty of people willing, I'm sure for one consideration or another yeah. to provide that for him if that's what he wanted. Yeah. And I don't suspect that it was about that he was a rapist in the sense that he wanted to do violence to women. I could be wrong about this. Mm. But what it seems to me is, to, to reduce it to what I think it's really about, is here's a guy, like many other people in the world, who was, you know, had, a, had an idea of himself, uh, somewhat justified idea of himself, from probably his formative years as being rather fat, rather unappealing, rather unattractive, rather right. unworthy, not just in, probably not just in the looks department, but you know, you know, the kind of guy that didn't get picked to be on other people's softball teams or be in their he was plays. Rejected. He was rejected. I'm sure he was Life rejected, of right. Um, so when he gets to the position of power, of right. huge power that he that he managed to orchestrate or managed to arrive at, you know, it's not enough for him to have a cascade of beautiful women outside of his marriage. He has to have women that are socially, or the, not socially, but considered by society, the most beautiful, the most talented, mm. the most. Uh, prized women in a certain, you know, in a, in a certain field right. in the world and, 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 you know, had to wheedle, force, cajole, pressure his way in that world right. just to, to say, you see, you see? Yeah. So th- that's no apology for him. I don't, I don't mean it in that context at all. Yeah, yeah. On the contrary. What it, what it means is, what it shows me is, and I still see the effects of it all over, is that uh, <laughs> Lord Acton's maxim is uh, true. Power corrupts people. Yeah. And... Do, would you put it all on power? I mean, if he never received that power, might he still be a rapist as a poor person? Doubt it. Really? Very much doubt it. I think power corrupts people. I don't I mean, there are other people that have reached the same power and they don't do anything like that. You know what I mean? There's going to be true. a certain... Yeah, I don't, I, there has to be another... I, I think there has to be a cofactor. I don't think just power. Right. I, don't, I don't think everybody who's powerful does that. Yeah. But I think when you have that much power, you'll find a very... I mean, as has as been evidenced by the number of people that have, who've, had, who've been outed, yeah. um, people, that other, people who have surprised many people... Um, I, I think when you have that much power, the temptation is huge for many people because they are made to feel uh, in their formative years like they are not worthy. Yeah. Now I don't know that's I don't I don't know if that's an ad for better parenting or you know, but <laughs> that would help. It's, it's hard to say. It's hard to help. say, but it's a but uh, my 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 the point that I'm trying to make is just that you know what what makes uh, what makes somebody have a need to do something destructive? Yeah, you know, destructive. It's funny that you brought that up so quickly. I, uh, my last guest just left minutes before you arrived, and at the end of that conversation, we were talking about Louis C.K. and um, my last guest, Jerry Minor, worked with Louis. A few times as writers and as actors, mm-hmm. and he ended up talking to Louis about what has happened. N- not since um, it all came out, but years ago, when at, right after it, the incident had happened, or at least this particular before it all came out. Yeah, but th- we're talking like fifteen years ago uh, when he did this. Uh, when he, you know, masturbated in front of these two girls that Jerry knows. I know them a little bit, but Jerry Jerry knows them a lot better. Um, and, uh, and, and at the time Louis didn't have, well, see, that's the thing, right? So he didn't have position like Harvey Weinstein, but he did have his own brand of power. Within, within the world that he was in, he was extremely powerful. 
extremely powerful Louis. Yeah. He was a you know he the Louis deal is the deal that every comedian wants to get. Yeah. Which is absolute, well, that he had anyway, absolute carte blanche power to do whatever he wanted with a very significant amount of money and absolute control over everything. And he, I mean, I, you know, Tig, Tig Notaro is a friend of mine. Hmm. And uh, as you may know, and probably many people know, uh, her, she was already well established in the kind of comedy world. Yeah. But when she suddenly came out with her, that famous performance that she gave where the she Largo, announced yeah. that yeah, the Largo performance where she said she had breast cancer. Louis was there and kind of trumpeted that and made that into such a thing that, you know, the world then knew who she was at, at a much greater scale than they had before. Now, flash forward, I guess probably two years or something, something like that, not, not that long. And, you know, she, he was a producer in namesake anyway, mm -hmm. on her show. Yeah, Amazon show. Mississippi, something about Mississippi. One Mississippi. One Mississippi. Yeah, yeah. now canceled, unfortunately. Very good show, um, I thought. But anyway, uh, you know, and b even before that, she, she had s claimed, I think accurately, that there was a bit that she had done. It was a short that she made. A, I can't remember exactly what it was about. It was a, a clown shows up for, she hires a clown for a, birthday or something I can't remember and that's a sad I don't remember the, I can't remember the specifics but she had came up come up with this bit and made it as a short film and then he did something I think it was on Saturday Night Live or something I can't remember he he did his own that was very clearly uh, I don't want to say rip you know off. a ripoff but it was right. it was close enough that it was it, it, it looked awfully close mm. But I thought, it, and she and she went on the warpath about it and said, you know, this is wrong. This is not right. And I, w I thought it was, you know, I thought it was strange. I don't think it was strange that she felt that way. But I thought it was strange, a little strange, that, you know, she made as much of a deal of it as she did. Although in the comedy world, particularly in the world of stand-up comedy, uh, piracy is is considered much more harshly than it is among actors where sure. people steal little things all the time. Yeah. But among people that write their material, you know, that's a major, major, uh, you know, that's a that's a capital offense to steal somebody's thing. Yeah. But I was surprised, <clears throat> him having been so important in her, you know, uh, popularity, that she made such a big deal of it. But then I heard through, through somebody else, through her, oh, there's a lot more mm. that you don't know about mm. with Louis. She started speaking up about that. I th I don't I don't know if she started speaking up about it, but I think she knew about it. I think she uh, knew she what did. had been going on. She did start speaking. I know she did because it was there were articles getting written up that Tig Nataro had conflicted um, uh, emotions about her knowing the things that Louis has done and having him as a producer on on her show. And sh just about shortly after that is when everything came out. Yeah, Louis. yeah. Um, yeah. Which is another, I mean, this is another whole interesting subject. Uh, you know, people are kind of on the fence about whether, well, some people are not on the fence. Yeah. Uh, There's uh, no uh, fence. <laughs> about whether or not somebody's work is to be um, discarded or, uh, right. you know. Can you separate them? Right. Yeah. Should you separate them? Mm -hmm. um, sh is there, a, you know, do we, do we deplore Roman Polanski, or even Woody Allen, uh, you know, my, uh, in my view, a much less clearly uh, proven miscreant. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I have personal things about him because I know him and I've worked with him for yeah. a long time. But he did seven movies with him. Yeah, yeah. but aside from that, uh, you know, do, do are we are we consider are we to consider somebody's ove uh, in the light of what we know about what we don't like about them as a human being? Right. Well, I guess that's up to the individual. Well, yeah. I mean, you, there's, there's, you can't, you certainly can't legislate somebody's taste. Yeah. But in, but in my view, there's, a, there's, I mean, there have been so many artists that have led lives that are not at all <clears throat> admirable in certain respects. Sure. Who yet produced work that is uh, eternal and that is, you know, important. Yeah. I, 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 I don't, I don't think that means they get a pass. Right. But I do think it means that we can consider their work independently, or to some degree independently, of what they, of what they, uh, of the way they acted as uh, on the human scale. Yeah, I mean, I 
I had never got into House of Cards, but I've always wanted to, <laughs> and I still think I'm going to at some point, even though it'll be, uh, you know, I'll just have to, like, try not to let that, what St- Spacey's done, affect my viewing. Well, it's interesting. I mean, there's, I, I don't know Kevin Spacey. I, I, I know Which people. Which is shocking, because you've been around, and you've done everything, and you've met everybody, and worked with everybody. Well, not everybody. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know him, but, I, but I, there's much that I heard about him, and there's certainly much. I mean, and Harvey Weinstein, I can tell you, for example, irrespective of, the, of his, of his uh, misdeeds against women, he was a prick. I mean, people respected the power that he had. And people respected the fact that he got movies made that were good movies. But I can't think of anybody in the business who had to deal with him who had very much positive to say about him. He was a bully. He was yeah. a big-mouthed bully. I mean, I heard him go, do, go into tirades about various directors. that he, he, was, he was a bully. That's the way he was. Nobody yeah. liked him. But he was a necessary person for many people. Yeah. I don't know that the same is true of Kevin Spacey. But I think there were many people uh, who found his, the, the expression of his power irrespective of what he tried to do in terms of coming on to people unpleasant. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that's true of everybody, but, but that's something that was told to me by people that did work with him. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I, I, I do think there are certain people who... Um, you know, have a reputation for be, for <laughs> for ha- you know having things insisting on things being their way to an extent that the, those that they work with find oppressive. Mm. Um, but this, that's still a separate question of what, are we then to condemn their work? That's another issue. Yeah, you know, I I'm, I have a piece that I'm r- working on. I've been working on it for a long time that I'm writing and ostensibly will produce if it winds up getting getting made. Preservationist. Yeah. Yeah. It was. It's now. It's gone through like several titles, and but that that piece, which I'll okay. maybe tell you about if we have time. Yeah. Um, but that asks that 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 question is central to it. You know, who gets things done in the world? Right. Well, you know, everybody knows that Steve Jobs, or most people admit that Steve Jobs, for example, really did change the world. Sure. I mean, he really did. But almost nobody who dealt with him personally has much good to say about him. Mm. He claimed, and I don't know if it's true, but he claimed that in order to the, the, the weight of changing things was so heavy, was so great that in order to Elon Musk, same situation. I have a Tesla, and I've heard many similar things about Elon Musk. Elon Musk, by the way, is a staunch anti-unionist, which I makes me very upset since mm. I'm unions are important to me. Yeah. But on the other hand, I love my Tesla. I love what he's. I, I think that's the future of automobiles. Yeah. So what I'm trying to say is the question of whether or not you can be a good guy and really change things in the world is an open question. Yeah. I'm sure there are people who, who, some people who have done it, but there are plenty of people who are more in the Steve Jobs mold who really did do something fantastic. Uh, Tesla himself, uh, Edison, others that I can think of, uh, who were... Um, uh, intolerant, to put it mildly, of others, yeah. and, and prove that you know constantly. You know, it's funny. It's interesting that you mentioned that. Like, I, I feel like we're we're all. It's not just an entertainment thing. Um, but you mentioned Jobs and, and Elon Musk. But it's also like, hey, I don't like the uh, the way animals are treated uh, who become my dinner, but I still eat the dinner. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Uh, I think feel like we're probably always making those decisions, even unconsciously, uh, every day. Yeah. You know? Like, I, I don't like, uh, you know, I heard about uh, the sweatshops in China that make iPhones, but I have an iPhone. I have iPhone, I, I, Apple products and stuff, you know? Yeah, if you really wanted to live a life that was uh, devoid of, um, you know, any kind of oppression or any kind of, uh, mercantile association with oppression, you'd you'd have to live a monk life, a mm. monk like existence because yeah, God tends to the clothes that we wear and the the stuff that we cook in and all that. You know, the United States is no longer 
contrary to what the president will have you believe, is no longer uh, 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 has much potential as a manufacturing place. It just yeah. doesn't. Yeah. Costs are too great. So they've all, go, you know, m- most of that manufacturing has gone to Asia, understandably. Mm-hmm. China, Vietnam, other, other places. Um, and there is implicit oppression in that because the reason it goes there is because co- work- workers are paid less, far less. Right. Uh, I'm, I think it'll even out. I mean, I think standards of living are increasing and demands will increase as time goes on. But, um, the, you know, it's just, like I went to Yale. There's a, there's a college at Yale that had been named for an early president of Yale. And they changed the name because it was clear that he was a slave owner and actually quite oppressive to the slaves that he owned. They which, ch- which one? I can't remember mm. what the, I can't remember which one it was. I wish I could. Most of the early ones. <laughs> well, you know, listen, they, Yale was founded, I think, uh, before the United States, so yeah, was founded. Well, so, yeah. so there. So it wasn't so unusual for people, particularly uh, Southerners, uh, but not all Southerners, uh, to have slaves. Yeah. Um, but there was an argument about it because the, the, does do we therefore you know do we want do we want to get rid of conf- confederate statues and confederate flags well I, I i understand getting rid of confederate flags you know because they're a symbol yeah. of oppression still yeah. and uh and i think confederate statues too i mean that yeah. makes sense to me yeah yeah um and a lot of those and the research i saw was a lot of those statues were built after um yes. the civil war as like a message to Right. The two two blacks like oh don't never you know, they don't want you to forget you yeah. know like right uh, and that's that's gotta be pretty that's a horrible message to leave up for yeah. hundreds of years yeah I, I think that you know that makes sense um, but are we to address you know do we I mean Lolita is a great book right by Nabokov right still is a great book it's about and by the way, it doesn't paint the its protagonist, who's Humbert Humbert, who's in love and pursues a fourteen or thirteen year old, I can't remember, year old girl. Uh, it doesn't portray him heroically, certainly. Right. But there's a kind of a, an implicit suggestion by the author that you know what this feeling is like. Right. You may you may have never. As a grown man, you may have never pursued somebody that was <clears throat> a young teenager, right. but you might know what it's like. You might see them in a hamburger joint and think, hmm. Maybe he was writing on his own experience or feelings. Yeah. I, I, I think there's nothing in his history to suggest that we know about to suggest that there was any actual uh, miscreants of that kind. Sure. But, um, <laughs> you know, he lived in the world with everybody else. Right. Um, uh, so, you know, d- is that book now to be shunned? Even though it's not, it's not about how wonderful he is, but it's also not about how awful he is. It's about kind of both. Right, right. Well, I mean, they've, I mean, I remember, uh, I don't know how many years ago it was, where they were talking about taking cigarettes out of I Love Lucy episodes or something, you know, because cigarettes were bad. And it didn't, didn't happen. I think we kind of talk about, the past of like, well, this is, you know, something that was made 50 years ago is no longer accepted these days. And then we should change that thing from 50 years ago. And what do you think and, about, what do you think about taking cigarettes out of co- contemporary movies? Uh, I'm, mm, well, I wouldn't have them, like if you watch some like 80s movies, I grew up in the 80s. So you, you could watch some PG movies with people smoking cigarettes and stuff. And I think that's a bad idea. Mm-hmm. Uh, or even cartoons. Um, I think that that sends a bad message. But for like an R-rated movie or maybe even a PG thirteen, uh, I guess it would depend. But um, but I'm okay with taking it. You know, don't aim it at kids. You know, I grew. I started smoking at fifteen. And I, I started started fourteen. Fourteen. But I stopped by the time I was twenty seven. That's good. I stopped at about thirty. 
Um, thank God, right? There you go. Like, thank God. I can't imagine. Yeah, I'm really, I, I have asthma. So for me to smoke is a completely moronic, but at the time I didn't know it. And asthma. your voice is your money, right? So well, it was. It's not so much anymore, but it was you know, for a long yeah. time. Yeah. You still have a great voice. And, uh, and if you had kept smoking, but, ah, it's Fred Malamed. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't think, I don't, I, I think that doesn't harm people's voices in the sense that it makes them sound worse, but I think that it harms them in the sense that it kills them, mm. you know? Well, that too. Yeah. Um, so what do you think? Do you think they should be taken out of movies? I think your I think your um, your suggestion of taking them out of movies that are aimed at young people is a smart idea. I, I blanch at the idea of uh, censorship for everybody. I, uh, not sure. censorship, but I, I, I kind of don't think they should be taken out of everything. On the other hand, you know, the truth is, when I was growing up, I'm much older than you. I'm 62, yeah. and when I was growing up, uh, everybody smoked. Everybody. I mean, it was very difficult to find people who didn't smoke, and you could smoke. Well, it was encouraged, right? I mean, didn't they even have advertising? Was like, hey, this is good for you, you know? Uh, yeah. Well, like I mean, there, there was. I remember advertising like in Mad Men. You see where doctors would recommend cigarettes, and yeah. you know, there was a Lucky had a thing: reach for a Lucky instead of a sweet. Yeah. As if it was a you know. <laughs> and there was the, 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 Phil, uh, the Flintstones had a uh, Lucky Strike commercial. Did they? I don't remember yep. that. The Barney and Fred are against the house, relaxing in black and white. Enjoying us. And they're like, smell. ah, this is the life, Barney. <laughs> 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 He's fucking crazy. But I mean, I do think, you know, the past is, I don't think we have to uh, whitewash the past. Sure. Um, but I do think, you know, it's it, we can, we, we it, it's wise to... to you know the, the the violence question is one that's not not so often asked anymore. But I remember when I was growing up, uh, you know, is there too much violence in movies? Is there too much violence on television? Does violence, in fact, be, on in the media or in entertainment, beget? Mm. And now here's another thing. Now we haven't talked about me at all, but here's another thing. Yeah. I think that the demonization of Hollywood as being this great. Um, standard bearer of unreal expectations is not correct. There are people who say, oh, Hollywood, horrible Hollywood that shows us uh, images of thin, beautiful people that are yeah. impossible to emulate in real life makes us hate ourselves. And, uh, you know, showing us giant houses and people driving Maseratis and all that. Right. Well, the truth of the matter is that all those paradigms, all those, all those, uh, those, models of what beauty is existed long before Hollywood. Right, long, right. long, long before Hollywood. And in fact, Hollywood has never been much of a leader of anything. Hollywood is uh, reactive, slow, reactionary, is much more of a mirror of what people kind of want and feel, especially what they desire rather than what they have, but what right. they desire, than it is a, a leader. That's true. I, I could see that why you say that. Because... Uh we're, we're kind of telling stories that that we grew up with, you know, that we uh, that we lived ourselves, right? Like writers and directors or whoever. Yeah, mixed with a healthy dose of what uh, is what appeals to the fantasy aspects of people's minds, whether or not they even know it. Yeah. I mean, I was watching The Godfather. Godfather is one of those movies. I watched a whole bunch of, of gangster movies recently. Like 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 half the people in the country, I've seen the Godfather saga ninety million times, and yet if it ever comes on television, I'll it. still watch it. Yep. I mean, if I happen to be flipping through the channels, yep, yep. It's, it's just there's there's just so much that's so great about it. Yeah. Um, and by the way, what's great about it is not the fact just that it's so full of violent retribution and all that. But that it's that, and there is plenty of violence and violent retribution, and but it's mixed with this kind of idea of loyalty, family, sensitivity. It's it's, it's the confluence of these things together. Yeah, uh, and the 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 authenticity of having people that are on one hand clearly horrible, capable of killing people without regret, and yet deeply love their families and feel protective of their families and pride in the things that we feel pride in and all that. It's the combination of those things. Yeah. So I was thinking, you know, so so why do we, you know, why are Martin Scorsese's movies, I mean, that's a, this is a big question, but <laughs> why do we enjoy 
movies that have so much violence in them and so and, and well the answer is i mean to reduce it maybe too much but the answer is because the people in those movies do things that we can't do yeah. that some part of us would certainly would like to do with impunity like they do yeah and to see the way that they pull it off you know with elon and with you know maybe sometimes paying a price for it but just to see them do it the rawness of seeing them do it um is stimulating and I think that even works with Desperate Housewives. You know what I mean? Sure. Like, who like these? This is not. I don't. I don't live like this person. This, I don't behave like this person. But it's fascinating, and people watch it. I don't watch Desperate Housewives, but um, but I think that that goes for like anything that's like, you know, The Bachelor or. Uh, or yeah. violent or so, so called reality TV. Reality TV or scripted, just anything. Scripted TV, by the way, is much more realistic than reality TV. I right. Think <laughs> fine. Uh, yeah, because, um, it, it, you know, y- you, could, you can watch something like, um, like uh, a Real Housewives or, or the Kardashians, right. and you could say to yourself, well, Jesus, I'm smarter than them. Yeah. I, you know, I, I, I can, maybe I can get a house like that. What? It, it, it's, it's so crazy. They're so dumb, you know, and they're so, but, and yet they have the, look at all the money they have, you oh, know, yeah. it's, I mean, Tens that's, of that's, millions that's of viewers. right. That's, that's part of the excitement of watching that is, is, you know, the fantasy of seeing, you know, cribs. It's, you know, you see the, the money in the houses and how dumb they are on top of it. It's part of the joy of it. Yeah. And and, uh, and it's just so it could be so different from your own life. And then like maybe sometimes there's something you can relate to. Yeah. You know, like if she's fighting with her mom or something. Like, yeah, oh, they're they're that? just they're 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 not only just people. They're like they're the most ordinary people, except that they have all this money and you know, some surgically uh, enhanced beauty and this and that. I mean, you're an actor, and so <clears throat> you maybe you have family members or friends or people that you meet that aren't actors or in the business in any way and they're just kind of fascinated by it uh, do they ask you questions like what's your life like if you worked with george clooney or woody allen no you know? they ne- they <laughs> i always assume they want to know that and they're not even really? slightly interested once in a while i, I my in-laws live in florida and once i don't i don't see them much uh, down there they come up to out to california once in a while uh, I'll go down there to visit them, and some friend of theirs from the country club will uh, come over with a knowing smirk and ask me something like that. But uh, no, they usually they usually uh, uh, the, the, I, the question that I get is uh, I'm sure the same question you get: is, How do you remember all those lines? <laughs> and you know, when I used to answer that earnestly. And say things, well, you know, it's a skill that, you know, you practice and you get better as you do it. And now I just say, oh, I just make them up. I, I don't care. You know, I don't <laughs> forget them all the time. I just say anything. I don't care. <laughs> well, I am an improviser, so I don't have to remember. Me too. <laughs> Me too, whether or not it's asked for. <laughs> uh, well, you, were, you mentioned Woody Allen before. You worked with him on seven projects. However, on IMDb, some of them you're uncredited. Yes. Why? Because they're voiceover? I mean, why don't they? Uh, they got me. Stuff? I don't know. That's bullshit. I don't know. Um... Well, I'm crediting you Thank for you. all all your work, um, but you but you haven't worked with him since 2002, thereabouts. Yes, a long time. A long time. Would you work with him again? Sure. Yeah, you would. All right. So, uh, so you're one of the you you believe you're more on his side because you know him. You're more friendly with him, and you. Uh, I I you know I, listen. The, the, <laughs> what I know about him, I I can tell you a little bit that I do know about him. I mean, the people who say, uh, you know, I won't work with him, uh, is that's because they believe uh, uh, the idea that he molested, uh, that he molested his daughter. Um, I find that extremely difficult to believe. I, I you know, I, I don't know the answer, but I find that knowing what I know about him, knowing what I know about Mia Farrow, knowing what I know about their situation, I found that extremely, extremely hard to believe. Furthermore... Um, you know, there's been exhaustive, exhaustive, uh, I, I see this argued about back and forth, but there's been exhaustive um, legal uh, examination of that question. And the, and the answer came back conclusively that the, that the, it was, it, the appearances suggested that he did not do that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the, p- people group his, his behavior with Sunni 
uh, into this assertion that he molested his, his daughter. Well, to me, those things are not related at all. So Ni was never his daughter. She was uh, never, you know, he, she, she, it's true that she was part of Mia Farrow's household, right. that they knew each other. Um, but he, they weren't even living together. They, they, were just they never lived together. He and Mia never lived together. And t- they live on opposite sides of Central Park. You could see her apartment from his apartment. They lived on, on she, one lived on Fifth Avenue, one lived on Central Park West. But isn't Dylan, Dylan's not his actual daughter, right? I don't want to say the wrong thing. I, I think she is his adopted daughter. I, be, I, I, I don't, I, I, don't, I, I, don't, I, don't Mia, I don't, I don't remember. Didn't, Mia didn't adopt I could be wrong. I, don't, I can't remember the yeah, truth. I don't think they're. Yeah, I think I think it's something like that. But um, I don't remember. But um, I, I find that very, very difficult to believe. No, uh, uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, and the idea that we should condemn him for his. I mean, also, you know, people I think got the wrong idea about Sunni. I, I, I was around him and Sunni many times. Uh, she <laughs> is a strong personality, a very bright person and kind of uh, does not, I mean, those who assume that she uh, took on a kind of a uh, submissive or, uh, you know, uh, some kind of role like that are entirely wrong. She, she is quite, I don't want to say tough on him, but she, she was responsible for getting him to be much more social. Woody Allen's an unusual person. I, I say this knowing that Woody Allen will probably never hire me again. <laughs> Woody Allen, um, it told me, uh, I was working on a play, uh, it was three one acts, one by Woody Allen, one by Ethan Cohen, one by Elaine May. And we were, I was sitting backstage with him, this is about six, seven, eight years ago now. And he said to me, you know, truthfully, if I could just write my movies, just spend every day writing, go out and have a nice dinner, he eats the same thing every day, eats fish for dinner, and go home and watch basketball, I would be fine. I don't, I don't, I don't, need to make these movies. But the fact of the matter is I don't trust anybody to make my movies. Woody Allen doesn't like being around people. He has a few friends, yeah. but he doesn't, he really truly does not like being around people. As you know, making movies is all about being around 20, people 24 fucking hours a day. Yeah. It's constantly people saying, oh, do you like this one? We can't get this actor. Can we find another actor? This guy's plane is late. This guy wants too much money. We can't get this location. Uh, we can't do this in Paris. We have union problems. What do you think of this dress versus this dress? It's nothing but pe- being a director, once you're done with the writing and the, and the pre-production, is all dealing with crises as yeah. they come up. That's what directing is. Right. Yeah. So, and Woody Allen can't stand dealing with people. <laughs> it's, he's the he's the the exact wrong person to be a film director, yeah. except for his aesthetic, you know, tastes about things. You should have stuck with stand up. Then you could just uh, well, you know, he doesn't have to I, talk to. He isn't having a conversation with anybody. He's just saying. I think if it was just him and the typewriter, and then he went out like he said to have a nice dinner, yeah. I think he'd be great with that. But he doesn't trust people to make his movies. You think that'll change? You think that'll change now? As he gets older? Well, now more and more people are coming out saying that they wish they didn't work with him, that they're not going to work with him, that maybe it'll be harder for him to get his movies. Well, he's going to be 90 soon. I don't think, I don't think, you know, I don't think we have, I don't think we have that long a future, but you, you, you never know. Um, I, I, I just, you know, I, I was speaking with Juliet Taylor about it, who's, who's my friend and his long-term casting director. Um, and he's, you know, we, people who know him at any, I mean, you, you don't, you can't tell about people, but I find it very hard. And knowing what I know about their relationship, you know, Mia was a very, very, uh, bitter about what happened, understandably. But I think that she, I think that she, you know, she has a streak where she was able to get uh, enraged uh, to to a degree that could, you know, be ruinous or desire desiring. I, I, I'm saying this, you know, uh, uh, perhaps speaking uh, out of turn because I who knows what really went on. Mm-hmm. But I personally uh, find it very, very, very difficult to believe. Also, you know, the circumstances. Here's a guy going through an acrimonious divorce, the most acrimonious separation and divorce being in supervised time with his children where there's always people there 
who that's the that, that would be insanely self-destructive to do something like that not that i not not that i think he would do it but that would be incredibly dumb yeah at that time i mean you know it, 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 it doesn't it doesn't make any sense to me yeah um, a lot of it doesn't make any sense though right i mean none of this stuff makes sense though well, <clears throat> like I mean, Louis C.K. masturbating for like that doesn't make any sense. That make that Bill makes Bill Cosby more, raping, drugging every all these wounds. That doesn't make but sense. That, but but, but I, I I don't think you can put them in the same category. Right. Sure. Bill Cosby, another there's another situation where, uh, you know, there's a guy. He I don't think there was a more powerful in the in the 80s in the time that he had his yeah. shows on TV. Uh, you know, he was Mister. NBC. He was missed. He was the biggest person in comedy and sitcoms and all that. Um, and stand up. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I mean, he could have negotiated all kinds of things if he wanted them. Why? Why do that weird, uh, you know, uh, kind of drugging people? Well, I mean, that's a good question psychologically, and I can only guess about what the answers are. I don't know the I don't know. Yeah. But I think it's kind of like it's like saying it never happened. Right. I think it's I I think it's, it's his way of like denial. Like she's not saying no. Yeah. Right? She's not yeah. fighting back. I, I, I didn't I didn't overpower her. I didn't yeah. if somebody has a prohibition against violence. Um, drugs are fun, you know. They yeah, and at the, he even said, you know, this was the time of of uh, soapers and, and, and quaaludes and shit yeah. like that. And, and uh, you know, I, I, that seems, it's funny to hear it that way, but I mean, it, you know, it's, it's interesting to hear how people, part of being an actor, part of what's so interesting about being an actor it, to me is how people tell themselves that whatever they do is okay. Mm. You know, the, 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 the catalog of human um, rationales is really, really interesting to me. Yeah. Um, and and because I and I like I really enjoy playing people that are a little bit extreme. You know, they're a little bit uh, bigger in some sense than 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 most people. Do you have one that sticks out? I have a couple. I mean, uh, I I really loved. There was a character in a play that I played many years ago, um, a character called Guichard in a play called Godsmoke, a now obscure play by John Gardner, the novelist John Gardner, who was, who was a soldier of fortune who kidnaps a princess. And it takes, takes place during the plague, and the only place to be safe during these plagues are monasteries. So he kidnaps her and takes her to a monastery and holds her for ransom. Hmm. That was a character like that. Um, the character in, in A Serious Man, yeah. uh, Cy Abelman, is like that. He's, he's ordinary in his looks and in his, uh, the, the kind of, um, in his prolixity, the way that he overtalks everything. But uh, his designs on Larry's life his 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 idea of taking over somebody else's life, his idea that he if only if only you know the world would swing if I were king if only everybody would listen to me everything would be great, and I'm willing to change the world, you know to make that happen. That put him in that league. Even uh, in Lake Bell's film, um, in a world, that character um, Sam Soto was a great character because. Um, Another bullyish character, but a bully with such, you know, a guy being kind of like, uh, kind of also ran to Don LaFontaine, a big voiceover guy, but not the biggest, mm -hmm. and forever in the shadow of John LaFontaine. And then finally, when Don LaFontaine <clears throat> passes away, he has this opportunity to finally shine, but can't do it. Um, so to play people like that, whose pride is great uh, and whose swagger is great, but who are so obviously clay-footed or so obviously so weak. That's interesting to me. Yeah. You know, so, so those are some of, some of the ones that stand out um, in my mind. Um, I have a movie 
uh, coming out, which I made with your girlfriend. Um, not it's over a year ago. Yeah, it's a year ago. I, I I'm hope I don't know when it's going to ever come out. I hope it comes out sometime soon. <laughs> Me too. Um, where uh, I have a character kind of like that, a guy who's to use a corny expression, larger than life. He's a he's a very well regarded novelist and poet who um, winner of pen awards and stuff like that. Who becomes a kind of a mentor um, for this youngish writer. Um, and he, first he's his professor, and then later, once, they, once they're out of the school situation, he becomes a personal friend and mentor. And uh, the younger writer um, is going through a phase where he's never really had much of an adult life. He's only been a writer. He's had some girlfriends, but he's never really had a serious relationship. And all of a sudden, he gets into a relationship with a woman who's a different kind of woman, mature woman, who has two daughters of her own, mm-hmm. and she's divorced, or I don't know if she's widowed or divorced, I think she's divorced. Oh, she's divorced, yeah. And um, he, the writer, um, doubts whether or not he has the capacity to sustain a relationship. And he gets the idea from me, his mentor, that maybe it's not right to, bur- if you're gonna be a writer, if you're gonna be an artist, you shouldn't take on these these prosaic responsibilities of money and family and shit like that. You should just devote yourself to your art, uh, and you know you, wh- why be why you know why take that stuff on when your art should be your the main thing you worry about. Mm-hmm. And he thinks that's going to be my point of view, and in fact, it's not. In fact, I tell him something you know that I regret having had all this hubris and made my art such a big deal in my life and my life has wound up rather hollow ultimately um, in my view Um, but it's about what it's about can you balance being an artist and devoting yourself enough to your art and also being you know a person you know can you handle a relationship where you're not you can't say oh I'm sorry sweetie I, I I I have to work this week or, you know, I can't be with the kids or I can't take care of them or I can't, you know, that's, I have children myself. Yeah. So you, have, you have twin boys? I have twin boys and uh, they were born with autism. So yeah. that, and one of them with, you know, quite significant autism, the, aut- the other one, not, not so much anymore, which I'm delighted about. But so, you know, that takes extra. It's a lot of work and a lot of care. Right. And, and a lot of unknowns, yeah. you know, you don't know how, how they're, how he's going to, do how he's going to proceed, and emotionally, it's a lot. And how old are they now? They'll be sixteen in November. And they're teenagers. And so they're even teenagers. if they didn't have autism, they're teenagers, right? Uh, and that's a With all handful that. <laughs> as it is, right? Absolutely. Uh, um, I mean, it's don't. Uh, I I have more fun with them and more joy out of them than anything else in my life, honestly. But a lot of times, it's hard too. Sure sure it is you know uh parenthood is from what i hear is very hard as is i have dogs and it's hard <laughs> well it's hard but you get so much back it's like saying as being an actor hard right. it's hard but you get it, the reward yeah it's like what i always say about like what i always tell people about young people about life and about acting is that the good parts are greater than you can ever believe. And the bad parts suck worse than you're worst imagining. <laughs> That's just the way it is. Right. Uh, and did I hear, did I read this right? You're adopted? I am adopted. And when did you find out you were adopted? When I was 27. Really? Yeah. Uh, it's a kind of a long story, but when I was 27, uh, my biological mother uh, came looking for me. Who's also an actress, right? She was an actress and a f- director, filmmaker. She lives out here still in, in California. You, you were adopted by an actor also. Or something, no, you? I was adopted by a producer, a guy a, a man named Lou Melamed. And my, my father was, at, in those days, a television producer. And my mother was kind of a wannabe actress, kind of, you know, sort of on the periphery, but sort of always had a sort of a hand in show business. So I was raised around all that. Did, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. Did, but it's so fascinating that on um, both of those families, there's show like showbiz 
family. You know what I mean? Like, did they know each other? No, no, no. So it just happens to be that way. That's yeah, so it was just uh, just one of those you know strange things. And my biological father, who I also knew, he's now he's now passed away, but uh, he was a psychoanalyst. He was a British psychoanalyst called Stan Silverstone. So my biological mother is an actress filmmaker. My biological father was a psychoanalyst. If you know me at all, that's so unbelievably like movie of the week that nobody would buy it. It's so corny, <laughs> right, right. but it's, it's true. Yeah. You know, it happens to be true. So, what ha- so how did you find out at age 27 that you were adopted? What's the, so how does that happen? Uh, my parents always told me that I was adopted. Well, they did. They did. Uh, when I was growing up, uh, I guess the, the the smart money said that you should always tell your children you're adopt they're adopted uh, as soon as they can talk. Yeah. So I knew that I was adopted. Oh, okay. Um, but I didn't know the circumstances. And my parents told me that they wanted to. My parents had been married for ten years before I was born without being able to have children. Okay. Uh, and they told me that they just wanted to adopt, and they w- went into a room full of babies and that I was smiling and they liked me and they chose me. That's what they told me, which wow. I believed. Okay. And that's not true. No, it's not true. <laughs> um, but, and I, and when I was young, I asked a lot of questions about my, my biological mother, particularly, you know, but then as I got older, I never felt a kind of a burning need to know. I, you know, it was, uh, I, I kind of, you know, accepted it, but it didn't seem a big deal to me. Okay. Um, I also the situation was complicated by the fact that I had that I had a sort of a difficult relationship with my mother, the, my adoptive mother, the mother that raised me. We, we didn't get along at all. I was close to my father, but not so much to my mother. Hmm. Um, Do you know why that is? <clears throat> well, uh, she was a, an unusual personality, very very volcanic. Uh, very narcissistic, hmm. uh, couldn't discriminate between easily between what was good for her and what was good for anybody else. And she wanted children to kind of show herself and the world that she was okay, that she was an okay person. Hmm. And if I were happy with her, uh, all was okay, but if I were not, or if I'm not happy with not not only with her, but about anything, then I was very much informed that my usefulness was conditional. That uh, the love that I received was not. Um, uh, it's not, not a right. It was a privilege. Exactly, <laughs> it was not available in all weather. Got it. So to speak. Hmm. So we we didn't get along well. And um, you were an only child. Did they adopt others? No, I I have a sister who was their natural child, six years my junior. Oh, so they did Jill. have a kid. They did, and as often happens, <clears throat> that's a common thing. You know, I, I, that they can't people can't have children, and then after they adopt, they found they find that they they do have mm. children for one reason or another. Okay, my sister is their natural child. Both my parents, both my adoptive parents, are now deceased. Was there? Uh, favoritism to the natural child? There didn't seem to me to be uh, when I was growing up. But when I got older uh, and was an adult, that definitely changed. That definitely changed. Why? Well, uh, Why and how? My sister, uh, for much of her young life and early adulthood kind of checked out of the family. She kind of didn't want much to do with the family. She didn't communicate much with the family. She wouldn't do any kind of family stuff like holidays and stuff. And, you know, she was just kind of separate. And uh, she struggled a lot with a lot of things. Um, and she's gay. And uh, she had some involvement with drugs and stuff like that, although mild, also problems with bulimia, mm. you know, uh, significant problems. Yeah. Great person, very smart, very funny, but in a way had a, had a hard time. She, she had a great deal of anxiety about being tested. So she kind of had a lot of jobs where she, for, for a long time, she was a waitress. And then for a long time, she was a manager of a uh, kind of comedy club slash 
Middle Eastern restaurant in the village in New York. Okay. Uh, uh, a per, and she, a person with her intelligence and her ability, that was a kind of a very uh, scant use of her abilities. But she, she, she was too anxious about being tested about things. So she couldn't, she couldn't kind of get to any higher level than that. Right. Anyway, <clears throat> I, in spite of my problems with my parents, was constantly trying, <laughs> trying to win their approval. And I can remember all these different things, these different stations of my life. I, mean, I remember specifically, like, you know, when I got into Yale, which was, God, it's over 40 years ago. Yeah. But I remember, you know, I thought, oh, this will be it. You know, I got it's to see Yale. Deal. It's a big deal. The Yale yeah. Drama School. If you're going to be an actor, I mean, it's a big. And, yeah. you know, and Yale is, you know, we're from New York. It's, you know, it's not like they're yeah, from yeah. Tennessee. You know, they know what Yale is. <laughs> so uh, I got to see Yale. Oh, that's great, They're terrific. You know, and then like years later, uh, I got a Broadway show. You know, and when I was a young kid, my parents always took me to Broadway shows. It was a big thing in my life. You know, so you grew up in New York. Yeah, grew up in New York okay. City. So I got a Broadway show, Amadeus, big, yeah, Tony winning, big deal, you know. It's a great play. Yeah, and uh, oh, okay, that's great. Well, you know, well, very good. And uh, <laughs> then you know, I I got married. Did and, they come see it? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, then I got married. They were not. Thrilled with my my choice of mates, I don't think. You still married to the yes, same yes. woman? Yes, yes. We're, we're together twenty five years. Who I met, and I thought she was lovely. She's a lovely person. I appreciate that. Her yeah. name is Leslie. I approve. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> but you know what happens is, and then, and then, and then, and this is the capper. My parents were old by this time. Finally, at the age of forty seven or something, I was already you know not young anymore. Mm. We had children. Yeah. yeah, and I told my parents, you know, we're, we're going to have children. Now, if that doesn't do it for you, if that doesn't do it for you, if you're a Jew or an Italian or anybody, it doesn't yeah. matter. You don't have to be Jewish or Italian or any. If that doesn't give you a little, you're going to have grandchildren. If that doesn't put you a little bit, make you a little, you know, noticeably happier, then there ain't much that's going to do it that your children can do. Or even like, just their own. Growth, right? So it's been decades since yeah. you were a child. Now you're almost fifty. I mean, did they did they just like open up at all in their older age? Did they just go? Well, you know what? we were so stiff back then. And now we no, can't. they weren't. And you know, my my they they were they were uh, they were affectionate. And my mother could be affectionate, although with her it was very much a spigot. You know, it was on a. My father was was always sweet, good natured, okay. but he was very much uh, kind of in my mother's shadow. Mm. In terms of power. Um, anyway, I remember one particular. I, I I did very well in the voiceover world, and I was making a lot of money. And my wife said to me, and I, and I as a present for them, they, we both lived in New York City, and they wanted to get their kitchen uh, redone. So as a present for them, I paid for them to get their kitchen redone. It was about. I don't know, about $25,000, something like that. But, you know, I was making a very good living, and I thought it would be a nice thing. And, you know, I did it. They were appreciative. They, 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 said, they expressed their appreciation. And then one birthday, this is before we had children, one birthday, I was probably, you know, 42 or 30, 44 or something like that. I was not young. And we were out in Montauk. We, we had a house in Montauk, and, my, and it was my birthday, and my parents didn't call me. And I said to Leslie, I said to my wife, you know, am I being too sensitive or something? But, you know, it's my birthday. Mm. They're my parents. Shouldn't I mean, I'm not expecting like a, you know, like a big present or anything, but like, shouldn't they call me or something? I mean, am I being too sensitive? And she said to me, don't you get it? Don't you, don't you understand? You're never going to get it from them. You're ne mm. They have you on a string. They keep getting you to dance around and be nice to them and buy them stuff and, you, 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 you know, no matter how much you argue with them, when they call, you come. You don't see that? And the truth is, I didn't see it. And Did you see it after she said that? Yes. And, I, and then I started thinking about it. I thought, she's right. And their own, I thought it was my duty in life. I thought it was my life's work 
to make life seem like a winnable proposition for them. Do you think that's because the story they told you about your adoption is that they looked in a, in a sea of babies and you smiled at them and, and made them like you somehow and you think like, oh, I have to recapture that moment? I, think the sto- I don't think it's because of the story. I think the story fitted their internal need. In other words, mm. it was their hope at some level that finding me and having me would make them would complete them, would right. make their lives happy, would make their li- make them whole. Hmm. That's a lot of pressure on a kid. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And parents don't usually do that. You know, a lot of people approach marriages with that or having children with that. You know, they, they think, if only I find the right person, I'm going to be whole. Hmm. And the truth of the matter is that that people don't get whole that way. I don't think very often. I think you have to have a, some semblance of wholeness first, right. and and you know, and and also have made peace with the parts of you that aren't whole, and that maybe will never be whole. Yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway, um, I, I think it fit this idea of theirs that this would make them okay. And, by the way, I was very happy to take on that role. Because after all, and this, this, interestingly, really fucked up being an actor for me for many years. Because I thought, that's what I'm supposed to do as an, act- supposed to do as an actor. I'm supposed to um, be superhuman. I shouldn't just be interesting. I should make people feel like their lives are, I have to be superhuman. I have to be... I have to show them that life is great, mm. right? You have to show them something that they can't see, right? Which I still, which which you may even you may even know from this conversation is a habit I haven't entirely given up. <laughs> um, you know, I still have that in me. Yeah. Um, but did, I'm sorry to interrupt again. No, but no. Um, after they passed, did would you feel like after they passed? Did you feel any relief or any regrets or both? Yeah, both. Um, How did they pass? My father. They both lived to be fairly old, uh, quite old actually. My father lived to the age of ninety-three. Wow. Yeah. He had had a um, a bypass when he was about eighty-two, and then he had a stroke, and he had a series of minor strokes, and then as he got older, um, he had digestive problems which they couldn't figure out where he stopped being able to digest food and eventually it was it was uh, ascertained that the strokes had prevented the um, I've forgotten what it's called you have an autonomic process which makes food go through you peristalsis you know normal people have but yeah. his strokes had affected him in such a way that uh, he couldn't the food wasn't digesting yeah. also he had shingles when he was quite old and he was in great pain and he, you know, the, the latter years of his life, he was a guy who for the first 80 or so years of his life had, was in remarkably good health. And then shit started going wrong because of one thing after another. So, you know, when that happens to people, very often people who've been in good health have a hard time dealing with, uh, uh, you know, having major problems. And it changed him. He was, you know, he became bitter. He became, it was unfortunate. Yeah. Um, sad. yeah. Uh, and he, he was, I was always very fond of him. My mother um, lived to be 90. Oh. And she, <laughs> I don't know what actually uh, happened with her, except that she, she had had, um, She'd had breast cancer, which she survived. She then had liver, uh, I mean, uh, um, bladder cancer, which she survived. And then she had some mild strokes. And then she started to fall and have trouble. And, you know, I don't don't know what the ultimate cause of death was, but I think it was was, uh, cardiovascular. Hmm. But she was already almost 91. Yeah, that's it's a good run for anybody. That's for sure. That's for sure. Anyway, so this is all a long story of telling you my situation with my parents. So when I was 27, yeah. 
I came home. I had been out playing cards one day, and it was kind of late. I came home maybe at midnight or something like that. And I had, there was an answer on my machine. These are the days when people had answering machines. Sure. Uh, saying, my name is Nancy. Please call me Collect in California. And her voice was kind of tremulous, you know. And I thought, well, maybe this is about job or something because it was California. She said, you can call, she said, you can call late. So I called her up, and she said, uh, my name is Nancy, uh, and I'm your birth mother. Mm. And uh, my head sort of began to spin, uh, and we talked for about three hours. Now, what did you think? Did your, did your adoptive parents tell you anything like, did they tell you anything like, oh, your, 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 your uh, biological parents are dead or something like that? Or nothing. nothing. We okay. don't know anything. Gotcha. So then she told me the story, Nancy. Yeah. And what the story was, was Nancy had gone to uh, High School of Performing Arts in New York. This is all in New York. She had gone to the High School of Performing Arts. She had a classmate, a friend of hers, a woman called Crystal Field, who in the theater world in New York is well known. She had a theater called Theater for the New City downtown, kind of an avant-garde <clears throat> theater. So Crystal and Nancy were uh, room, not roommates, uh, classmates. And Crystal's mother was an obstetrician, and they lived in Queens. An obstetrician slash abortionist, I guess. <laughs> So uh, sometimes uh, Crystal's mother would set up private adoptions for people. Wow. So my parents had a friend, had friends, for whom Crystal had set up a private adoption of a girl roughly my age, a girl that I knew. So my, my parents went to Crystal because, Crystal's mother, because of this other friend of theirs that had adopted a baby through her. I said, listen, we'd like to adopt a baby if you know of anybody. So Nancy had Nancy was 20 or 21, 20, I think, at the time. She had just moved out of her parents' house. And my parents paid, my adoptive parents paid for Nancy to live in Crystal's house, Crystal with her mother, in uh, Forest Hills for the latter six months of her pregnancy, the last six months of her pregnancy. And then when I was born, uh, I was to be turned over to them, to my adoptive parents. Hmm. And both parties, it was supposed to be a blind adoption on both ends. Neither party was supposed to know who the other party was. <clears throat> However, <laughs> my parents uh, decided to save a few shekels by having a cousin who was a lawyer take care of the paperwork, who was like a real estate lawyer. He didn't know anything about adoptions. Anyway... He gave the wrong papers to each party so that each party then knew who the other party was, which they were not supposed to. <laughs> so each party knew the other party's name. Oh, wow. So Nancy told me that she fantasized for the whole, much of my early life, that she would move in next to me and watch me grow up and all this oh, kind of stuff. That's creepy. <laughs> um, and I realized after knowing Nancy for a while, and Nancy, I asked Nancy, you know, why did you come now? Why did you decide to find me now? She said, well, I had this feeling that you needed me, which I thought meant uh, that means you needed me. Mm. <laughs> uh, and it, what it in fact happened was Nancy was single. She had had a husband who uh, brought her out to California from New York, and he had one of those little uh, English... Cars. I can't think of the name of it. It's a uh, begins with an M. Oh, the the Mini Coopers. It's not a Mini Cooper, but it's a small car. And he was driving driving it at Sunset Boulevard. Somebody hit him, and he was killed in this car accident. Oh, that's she, your father? That's not my father. That's oh, just the man who married her. Married. Okay. Then she had a son. She had three children. She had me with this guy Stan, who was just an affair that she had. Then she married this other guy who was a director, and she had two sons with him. Uh, and her latter two sons, there was five years between them. So there's me, then five years later there was a... Sorry. Oh, oh, sorry. That's okay. Five, five years later there was another son, and then five years later a son after that. So 
three sons, each separated by five years. Hmm. So the middle son, whose name was Eric, they lived on Sixth Avenue by the Waverly Theater, with now being now the IFC Theater and Sixth. I don't know if you know you know. New York. Uh, I've been to the IFC Theater. So uh, they lived over that, and he was crossing Sixth Avenue, and he was killed by a car. He was oh God. Was. Okay. Uh, then um, her mother, Nancy's mother, who also lived out here, had recently passed away. So she had a lot of mm, loss in her life. And her yeah. son, who was 10 years my junior, he was 18, was about to go off to college. Losing him, too, right. in a way. So she, she was kind of all alone in the world. And she was living where at the time? She was living in Brentwood, in California. In California. Yeah. Which is... Was she still trying to be an actress? I looked her up. She only had like two credits on it. Yeah, she she uh, she was she did a lot of theater. Mm -hmm. uh, she never she was kind of always you know kind of knocking around, but she never kind of you know made it into the bigger leagues. Did she? By that time, you were already getting credits and stuff like that, right? Yeah, so. no, she was very. She was when she found out that I was an actor and that I had gone to Yale and all this stuff. Uh, she was very excited, and in fact, it turned out that we we knew quite a few people in common. Um, she had I had worked at the Guthrie when I first got out of school, which is a theater in Minneapolis. She had been there. She she there was a guy that I was friends with that had been her boyfriend, and we had right. crossed paths oh, many that's times. So weird. Yeah, there was a lot of weird stuff like that. That's so weird. So, uh, that's so strange. I mean, this is go this story, story goes on and on, but to, just to give you one example. So she said she was going to come to New York. So she said, do you want to meet? I said, yeah. So I walked into this hotel with a box full of pictures of my childhood, my sister, my parents, you know, growing up, Fire mm -hmm. Island, where we had a house. And By the way, sorry to interrupt again. Uh, after... You, she calls you, and now you have this conversation. Do you call your adoptive parents and say, "Guess who I just got a call from?" Yes, I didn't know whether or not to do that. I was I was unsure about whether or not to do that. And then I thought, well, you know, in matters of state, best to come clean. Mm. So I did go over to my parents and say, you know, this woman contacted me. Her name is Nancy Zala, and she said that she's my biological mother, my birth mother. And they said. Yeah, that's true. And they it, so they kind of looked at each other and they admitted it. Yeah, oh shit. Yeah. <laughs> Did you say why'd you guys lie? And they 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 lied about. Uh, I I, I didn't want to confront them with anything that was accusatory because already they were like, freaked you know, they were they, yeah they were a little freaked out by it. Uh, Did you ever get the answer to that ever? Like why they changed the story? Why they felt that need? I, I, I don't think so. Did you ever want to know why? Well, I think they were... I, I mean, I, I didn't think of it like that, but I, I mean, I, 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 my guess is that nobody was supposed to know who the other person was. Hmm. And um, I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know the answer to it. Hmm. All right, so you have a box of stuff. You're visiting Nancy. Yeah, and she has a box of pictures, and we're looking at it, and it's it's a very strange feeling because, you know, I look like her. I really talk like her. We we, my wife, was when my shirt, when my wife first met her, she was laughing and laughing because, we have the same gestures. Wow, that's we so we, we I talk with my hands like she does. Uh, we we had the same slightly pompous way of talking and <laughs> you know it was really funny oh that's genetic i guess i guess more than you more than more than you'd think it yeah. was um anyway but you don't know each other it's funny because you yeah. know you're connected but you really don't know each other at all yeah. and she said to me um this was about maybe 10 o'clock at night and she said uh i'm kind of hungry is there a place that you could we could get something to eat so I said, yeah, there's this hamburger joint. It's open late. It's uh, uh, Jackson Hole. You guys ordered the same thing. Uh, wait. Right? Okay. okay. So we go, we, go to, we go to Jackson Hole, and we're sitting there. Nancy orders a hamburger, and I get a hamburger or something. And we're sitting and talking, and she has this white, silk, beautiful blouse on. And she took a bite of the hamburger, and when she took a bite, about a, about a cup of ketchup yeah. came squirting out all over the back of the hamburger, all over her. Yeah. Blouse. And I knew, and I had any doubt at all that I was related to her. <laughs> it was, was it. vanquished in that because I was so me, so you know, perfectly. Well, maybe I'm related to her too, then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
That's funny. What a, that must be so wild to, to get that phone call. And like your life just kind of changes from then. Yeah, and there was, I mean, there's a, it's a much longer story than that. She, she, I asked her who my father was. She told me this guy. Uh, I pursued a relationship with the guy. And then a few years later, she said, oh, I, I, it's not that guy, it's somebody else. Oh, really? Yeah. Why, why'd she lie to you about that? That's a good question. Is she still alive? Yeah. Well, you could ask her. I did ask her. Oh, you did? Okay, yeah. what'd she say? She said, because the guy that I said it was was somebody that I really loved, and I wished it was him. But the guy that it actually was was somebody I didn't know that well, and you know, I felt kind of funny about it. Weird. So with this first guy... Did you have a relationship with him? Yeah, he that guy. So he was lied to, thinking that you're his right. son. Oh my god, right. <laughs> fucking crazy! <laughs> that is crazy. There's a there's a there's a lot in my story that is, um, um, you know, dramatic, or I don't know what you call it. It's yeah, no, it sounds dramatic. Very soap opera y. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Um. Anyway. Eventually, uh, she, the right guy. Yes. <laughs> and I got to be friends with him. And strangely, um, me and my wife and kids were living out in Montauk then on the East end of Long Island. Mm-hmm. We moved out there because of my son that had autism. We wanted to get him services and we didn't want to live in the city. And right. we had a beautiful house. I really liked it. But the strange thing was that my biological father who when my own, when the father who raised me died, which was many years later, I then called this other guy and said, would you like to meet? I didn't meet him for many years. Nancy showed up when I was 27. I didn't meet my father till I was 50. So 23 years passed in, in between there. Wow, that's a long time. Yeah, I was, I was because, of, because of things that happened with Nancy, I kind of didn't want to pursue it any further also I was close to my father I, re- I loved him the father that, that yeah and I kind of felt like while he was alive I, I wasn't sure about it I thought maybe like I felt betrayal or something. yeah kind of hmm. so anyway once he passed away I thought well maybe the other guy is not going to live so long so if he's still alive or I yeah. guess you knew he, I guess well I didn't know he was still alive you didn't know I didn't yeah. so I just wrote him a letter I had an address for him I wrote him a letter hmm. And he said, yes, I would like to meet. Wait, what's in that letter? Like, how do you word that? Well, I had to ask his apology because what had happened was when I found out that Nancy had told me uh, what was not the truth, when I found out what the truth was, I insisted that she tell the guy that thought he was my father that he was not and the guy that actually was, that he was. Mm-hmm. Until that point, the guy that was my father, I was 28 by that time. He had no knowledge of it. Right. So all of a sudden, I was 28 years old. He suddenly hears he has a son that he doesn't know about. He then wrote me a letter okay. saying, would you like to meet? And I, didn't, I never answered him. I was too, the whole thing was too, too weird. much for me. And... That was when you were in your 20s? Of that 28. That letter? Okay. Right. So, so then, she did tell him. She did tell him. Okay. Then by the time I'm 50, when my father who raised me was dead, I thought, well, maybe I would like to meet him. So I wrote him a letter apologizing and saying, listen, Mm -hmm. I'm sorry for never answering you. I should have. But it was uh, was just kind of overwhelmed. It was kind of all too much for me at the time. But I hope you can forgive that. And if you're still interested in meeting, I would like to meet. And he wrote me back saying, yes, I would like very much to meet. And strangely, we lived in Montauk. He lived uh, on Shelter Island, which is like mm. a half an hour, less than a half an hour away. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> one of those, another one of those things. Yeah. So I got to know him well. I got to know his wife, and he had two daughters that were his stepdaughters that he raised, essentially. Right. Uh, and I got to be very close to them and their families, and I'm still very close. We're still all very close oh, to wow. them. Okay. That was that, that was a, a great part about it, but he only lived for another, I think, four years, and then he passed away. Wow! Well, it's a good thing you wrote to him when you did, I guess. Yeah, yeah. You know? Wow, that's crazy. Did you ever go to therapy? You ever do therapy? <laughs> you bet I did. Yeah, right. I, mean, I had a lot of years. 
Um, I had one, I've had I've had many therapists, but I had one in particular who was a psychoanalyst in New York, an English guy, uh, who was great. I, I had a great uh, experience with him and very helpful. Very yeah. helpful. Yeah. Are you still doing therapy or no. not for a while? No, I'm not. I could probably use some, but I, yeah. <laughs> but I haven't gone in a long time. Yeah, I, I go to therapy. Um, uh, actually, after I talk to you, I'll be talking to my therapist. Oh, good. <laughs> um, that's crazy, Fred. All that stuff, I'm, I'm like soaking all that in. I'm like <laughs> trying to. Have you ever thought about writing a book? Uh, I've thought about it, but you know, it's kind of like. For one thing, it's so like I said, it's so it's so full of, you know, corny television tropes that I think. <laughs> you, it's okay. I, uh, I don't know. And the other and uh, there's other things. I'm by, by the way, you and I have a, have something in common. Although you were, I have. Did I? I don't know if I told you this. Uh, a totally different page. Did I tell you that I have this disease called idiopathic intracranial hypertension? Did yes. I tell you this? Yes, I believe you did. Is there, something to do with your eyes? It, yes. Well, it, 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 it's 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 a neurological disease. But its main danger is that it causes blindness. Right. It doesn't do it in everybody. It depends. Right. Um, and when, I w- when it was discovered that I had it, which was 2001, what is that, 17 years ago now, yeah. um, they discovered it. And the, initially the doctor said, well, okay, we're going to do watchful waiting on it. I was having symptoms of it. But he said, you know, I don't, I don't, there's, there's surgical treatment for it. And... The surgical treatments are nasty. They um, they have to put a shunt in your spine to drain. It's what it what it is is you have too much pressure in the spinal fluid that surrounds your brain and spinal cord, mm. and that's a closed system. Is this a genetic thing? It's not known what causes it. Okay. Um, it usually occurs in women. It's relatively rare in men, but it's it's not unknown in men. Mm-hmm. But it occurs in about eight times more women than men. Mm. It occurs with polycystic ovary disease in women for some reason, but nobody knows why. Yeah, why you get it? Um, there's too much pressure in there, and it's not known whether you produce more or if it's not cleared. It's cleared into your bloodstream, but the, the think most of the thinking now is that you don't clear it properly. Anyway, the <laughs> That's oh, dog. Sorry, here. That's all right. It's lonely. He's lonely. Maybe I'll let him. Yeah, hold on one second. What are you whining for, you big baby? You need to go pee or something? Who's that? Want to come say hi in front? Yeah, come over here. <laughs> you big silly guy. You probably heard the, the pool guys. And he's like, well, something happened outside. I'm going to check it out. There you go. All right, sorry about that. No, no, it's fine. Go ahead. So I found out about this in 2001, and initially the doctor said, well, let's not, the, the surgical uh, interventions are kind of tough. Yeah. Uh, there's, they shunt you, and they put a shunt in you, and it has to go from your spine, and very often shunt gets tangled, it can, and there's uh, another, it's, it's nasty, and there's another thing where they put a drain in you, and it actually comes out of uh, you, it's not good. Uh, um, and it can also be treated with medicine. Oh, that sounds good. But it depends on how (laughs) severe it is. Okay. So initially they did nothing. And then all of a sudden, one day, like less than a year into it, before I started noticing that I was not seeing very well out of one one of my eyes. What would that look like? Blurry or? No, I had a a major blind spot that got bigger and bigger. Mm. And I started noticing. Well, the way I noticed it was that I was not having any... Depth perception, like I was trying to light mm. a candle, yeah, and I just like couldn't. Mine's affected too, depth perception and stuff. Yeah, sometimes I'll go to reach a cup and I'm like, "Where's?" It's I have to be very careful on stairs. I, I, I stairs, too, yeah, because yeah. they look. It's, it's the pattern. It all yeah, looks it's the same exactly. And, yeah. So uh, and then I know, and then he gave me this test. This uh, I forget what they call it. It's a machine. You, yeah, uh, and uh, I said, "Well, you know, you're." Your, your blind spot is very enlarged and then he looked and he saw that there were hemorrhages in there it was not yeah. good so um, he put me on a medicine which I've been taking now for since then 18, 17 years oh, wow. uh, which I tolerate 
Well, it's not, you know, okay. it's not, it's not, it's, 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 it's become knock on wood, you know, it's a, it's just a inconvenience. It's not a huge uh, deal for me. Yeah. Uh, and it s- helps to it, help that. Yeah. Thing. It never got better. Okay. What I lost, I never got back. Okay. Never but got uh, it's never gotten worse. That's good. So it's a big deal. What is the drug? Uh, it's a drug called Diamox, which uh, is usually given for, al- it's, it's usually given for altitude sickness. Hmm. Uh, and it was in the old days given for um, for glaucoma, but they have better drugs now for glaucoma. Uh, it has some side effects, but they're not you know they're n- nothing horrible. Where are the side effects? Um, it tends to cause kidney stones in people, mm. uh, and it makes <laughs> it makes carbonated drinks, which I I like sodas. Yeah, it makes carbonated drinks taste very weird. Mm, that's a, that's uh, a weird side effect. It is, but it drinks. Well, it's it, I, I, why it does that. I have no idea. But I, after a year or two, I, I got, it, they taste normal to me now. Like whatever okay. the difference is now, I'm I wonder what that it. tastes like. Yeah, that's, that's weird. So where is the blind spot? Which eye is it? It's in. Well, I have it in both eyes. I have in large blind spots, but in my right eye, about I lost about a third of my field of vision. Permanent. Th- okay, all around. Yeah. Well, in one, it's in one. It's not all around. It's, it's okay. A, it's a, so you have something called a visual field, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. So there's everybody has this thing called the blind spot. It's normal. It's where, so your eyes like a ball like this. Yeah. The back of it has an optic nerve, and the optic nerve connects to your brain. It goes yeah. right directly to your brain. So that and the optic nerve has a sheath, and the nerve is actually in a sheath like this, mm-hmm. right? So there's pressure inside that sheath. Because that's where your cerebral spinal fluid is right. in there. When there's too much pressure, it pushes on the back of the eye, and that's where your retina is. Your retina is like a piece of film. It's a flat piece of film at the back of your eye. So it pushes on the retina, and then you get um, parts of the retina die. And then you get this thing that I have called, metaform- <laughs> called metamorphopsia. What that what's it, that weird name, which means you get scarring all over the retina. And when the retina scars, even the part of me that can see, I don't see straight lines anymore. Mm. Like where mm-hmm. the lines should be straight, they're all it's just like an astigmatism or something. It's I don't see straight. It looks it yeah. looks like I mean I'm, your brain gets used to it for a while after mm-hmm. a while, and you you compensate for it. But like if I look at that through the, it's not I don't have it in this eye on this side. If I look at that. Um, that line yeah. where the counter is, instead of being straight, it goes like this. It's all, it's nothing straight. Really? Yeah. Strange. Can it, you read? I close one eye when I read. Really? Yeah. I mean, I can read without it, but I find it's easier to close one eye when I read because hmm. it messes up. Driving is not an issue. I can see well enough oh, to yeah. drive. Oh, jeez. That's scary. Yeah, I'm, I'm lucky that way. But, and in some people, uh, it gets worse. Yeah. It's but for me, I'm you know in the 17 years it hasn't or 16 and a half years since I had that, it hasn't gotten anywhere. But I only say that because uh, I know I'm not saying anything very sage or wise. But eyesight is one of those things that you never think about until something goes wrong with it, and then you realize how oh, yeah. essential it is to everything in life, and it just changes your your view of of, of how you perceive things. Yeah. Obviously, I mean, well, the, I mean, there's what is, there's five senses, but vision is. They say it's like eighty percent. You have your brain of your of the those senses. Uh, so you, when that's gone, you only have twenty percent, and that twenty percent has to make up for what it's lacking, uh, somehow. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's crazy. Yeah, the my blindness runs in my family and stuff, and. Um, do, is it progressive? Do you know? I mean, yeah, yeah, it's progressive. And uh, um, my grandfather was blind, and uh, but you know, what's the name of the thing you have? Choroideremia. And what's funny, what's weird about families and secrets. So my parents never told us that there was a possibility of this happening. And is it on just one side? That comes my from? mom's side. So my mom's a carrier, but they were probably hopeful that it was not genetic. Because my mom was like, well, I, when I've talked to her, she goes, well, I see fine. So that probably means my children are fine. So it was never discussed. 
I, I started noticing things in my teens, and I brought, went to an eye doctor, and he, he, you have to look for what I have, kind of specifically. He, he was a bad doctor, so he didn't see anything, and he sent me on my way. And I what was, is it, actually? It's a... Uh, uh, it's a uh, it's a it, it, uh, erosion of uh, the outer, the outer vision, like the the co the cones and stuff. It all it's all blood flow, right? So the blood flow doesn't go to the eyes as much. So it's everything starts deteriorating, and uh, and it closes in to the central. Like so the you have only so you have more tunnel vision, like I have like a tunnel vision. It's kind of it's going toward tunnel vision. So I don't have any peripheral vision, um, and then side effects are like light sensitivity i can't see shit in the dark or if it's dimly lit it's even more dim for me i have that too yeah so uh, uh and it's genetic so it's like the females are carriers and the males get it so my brother has it my sister's a carrier so is it 100 percent that the males get it or close to it i think it's a hundred i think it's a hundred percent that the m hundred percent that the males get it. It's something like a hundred percent males get it, and it's fifty fifty that the females become carriers. But who knows what's what? In my family, it's a hundred percent. And is there any kind of intervention they do for it? No, not yet, not yet. And my sister's got two boys, and they both have it. But we've been keeping it a secret from them for their entire lives. How old are they? Thirteen and nine. And uh, I was hoping. I was really against that because we've known now. I was officially diagnosed when I was 27. Um, uh, and then we all got tested. So, I, you know, I, I encouraged my sister to not keep secrets because I felt like I was lied to or I was, some, some information was kept from me. And, uh, and I didn't think that was fair. And Is there a genetic test they can do for it specifically? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, they, they were tested when they were babies. Mm -hmm. Um, so we, we've, we've known their whole lives, so they still don't know. And now they're, now the older one's getting to the age where I was noticing stuff and, uh, and I don't know which, what, what they're going to do. I don't know. It's very weird. Families. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, we were thinking, Deborah and I were talking about adoption. Well, I'll tell you something. Um, I have a lot of friends who are adopted. Hmm. Uh, and the vast majority of my friends who are adopted, I, I, and even with my reservations about my family, I'm extremely glad that they adopted me. Extremely glad that they adopted me. I think uh, that was, it was a good thing for them to do, and it was good for me. And... Uh, I have much more, although you might not know it from this interview, I have much more positive to say about them uh, than negative. And, and I think it's a great thing to do. And uh, I have many friends, um, Fran McDormand, uh, many famous people. Francis McDormand? Is she yeah. adopted? Oh, yeah. I didn't know that. Yes. As you may know, uh, there are many people who are extremely uh, accomplished in life uh, there's a theory that people who are adopted have something to sort of prove, mm. but uh, Steve Jobs was adopted. Mm, I didn't know. Uh, yes. Um, um, what's his name from Amazon? Uh, oh, uh, Bezos. Jeff Bezos is adopted. Mm. Uh, if you look, if you go, if you go on, is if, Donald Trump adopted? He has something to prove. <laughs> yeah, but I don't think he's in the high achiever category. <laughs> no, he's not. No, I don't think he is. If you go, if you if you just Google American adoptees, you'll see like hundreds of Famous people. You know, because there's about a quarter million uh, orphans in the U.S. and tens of millions in the world, if you mm -hmm. go worldwide. And I was thinking about this. I heard um, a statistic that 100 years ago, the popu world population was like 1.5, around 1.5 billion. And now it's at almost 8 billion. So I, so I'm, I just think about like in 100 years, how many billions of people there will be and how many more millions of kids that that will be without families and stuff you know, yeah sad. i think it's a great thing to do i think i think you know if my in, 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 if we were not able to have children i would certainly adopt them i would yeah. want to adopt them yeah. if i could um and you know you don't know what you're going to get but you don't know what you're going to get yeah, anyway. if they're biological children no uh and you, know, uh, you could adopt older too you know you could yeah. adopt you know those kids uh need it too they need help too 
Um, yeah, we're thinking about it. we're thinking about that. Um, Fred, all right, we got some. You guys still got time? Yeah, because I didn't even get to my notes yet. There's still like so much. Okay, so there was. Yeah, you, I'm already guessing you'll have to come back sometime because there's. So I'd be happy to. Because we got into like that whole Harvey Weinstein stuff. Um, okay, so at one point you had a fear of flying for 20 years. I did. Well, why? Why was that? Well, why is a good question. I don't know the exact reason why, but I. I um, when was this? When was this fear? I started having the fear when I was in college. Hmm. Oh, you started in college. Okay, yeah. so you had already flown. Yeah, I'd flown many times. And it was fine. And then in well, I, it was. I wouldn't say I was fine. I was nervous, but I was. I was willing to do it. I flew it with a certain degree of anxiety, hmm. and then it, the anxiety got to be so pervasive that I just wasn't willing to do it. And I didn't fly for a long, long time, and then uh, in, in 1998, in December of 1998. Or December of 1997, I should say. I was working for CBS. I was the voice of CBS Sports. That was right. one of my great voiceover gigs. And they ch- and there was and the Olympics were coming, and CBS had the Olympics that Japan. year. Japan, right? Nagano, Japan. Yeah. That year, right? Yeah. yeah. So that, to get to get that gig is a plum plum gig. Yeah. Uh, that's you know that's the real big time as far as being in a, a voiceover guy goes. So <clears throat> finally, at the last minute. It was between me and another guy, and they chose me. And I was so nervous about it. I just thought, oh, God. And I called my agent, and I said, listen, I don't think I can do this. Mm-hmm. I mean, I have to fly. It's a long from, flight. Well, I had to fly from New York to Tokyo, and then, oh, and then, <laughs> and then Nagano was another, I don't know, few, a couple of hours on a bus or something, but I said, you know, <laughs> Tokyo. And I hadn't flown in over 25 years at that point. Wow. And, and that's like a full day of Fly. It's 13 hours. 13 hours from New York to, to Tokyo. Tokyo? That's yeah. actually less than I thought. Um, it's not so bad. I mean, well, it depends how you look at it. But So my girlfriend, now my wife, Leslie, we, weren't, we were living together, but we weren't married yet. She worked for Lord & Taylor. She was the head of um, print for Lord & Taylor, like all the magazine ads and you know catalogs and stuff like that. Mm. And she said to me, I talked to my agent. He said, listen, you have to do this. He said, this is a million dollars in a bag. You just have to go get the bag. You just have to go do it. <laughs> well, it's a million dollars. Well, it wasn't literally a million dollars, oh, okay. but, but it, was, it, would have, it, it led to millions of dollars. Oh, wow. It, I mean, oh, it literally, literally did. Wow. Okay. Well, that's a lot. You suck it up. Just tranquilize yourself like, like well, Mr. T in the 18 or something. Yeah, but I, was, I wasn't even willing to think about that. Yeah. So Leslie, my wife, then my girlfriend, was working for Lord & Taylor. So she said, listen... I can't, I, I had to be there for five weeks in Nagano. Oh, wow, that's a long gig. Yeah. Hmm. So she said, listen, I can't stay with you because I have to work, but I'll fly with you hmm. to Japan, okay. and then I'll come home because I have to work, and then when it's time for you to come back, I'll fly back to Japan and get you, and wow. get you which was, I thought, well, that sounds like love to me. That sounds very... That's very sweet. Uh, very sweet. And then... She just wants to go to Japan. <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, she she went up with a big trip to Mickey Moto. I didn't know about pearls at the time. <laughs> anyway, so then um, I found a guy who was a combination airline pilot and therapist. This guy called Tom Bunn, who, wow. who has a program called SOAR, S-O-A-R. It's, you can look it up on the internet. And uh, I went to him, and I took his course, and then I dealt with him personally, and it really, really worked. It really helped. Hmm, okay. It was very so useful. So how, how, how many cl- classes was the course? Was well, to show you how long ago this was, this, it came on, on, on cassette tapes. Oh, okay. <laughs> it was like 12 cassette tapes and two books, wow. and, and then you have sessions with him. And I only had two sessions with him. Interesting. Um, there are people who do it without the sessions with him, but I... Is it a lot of like breathing exercises and There's telling? two parts to it. Okay. Two parts to it. One part is all about flying. It's interesting because he's a therapist and he's a pilot. Hmm. And the part about flying teaches you all the things about flying that you'd ever want to know and especially about things that might make you nervous. Okay. You learn statistics. I mean, for example, um, you're safer on a commercial airline flight 
literally, than you are in your bed in your house. More people are killed sure. by having books fall off their bookshelves and hit them in the head, <laughs> literally, <laughs> right? than are killed in commercial airline flights. Wow. Um, until 2017, he, he said, how many people would you guess between 2007 and 2017 have died in commercial airline flights in, ten, in those 10 years in the United States? Bear in mind, there's millions of flights, millions of flights, and hundreds of millions of people fly in that time. How many people would you guess died? I said, I don't know, 10,000? 5,000? Zero. Mm. Not one person died in 10 years of commercial aviation in the United States. What years? You said it was 7 to 17. Seven, yeah. Oh, uh, is it, when did you... When, when, who, or whenever... Oh, this was actually... This was, this was, that happens to be true for those 10 years, but he asked, okay. it, but he asked it to me for the period that we okay, were talking okay, about. Gotcha. Um, the likelihood of getting killed on an airplane is so is so tiny. Yeah, it's it's infinitely infinitesimally tiny. Um, you are far 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 more likely to be killed by getting by pulled apart by dogs, right? Kicked by a horse. Well, now people are more worried not that the plane will go down, but by the people on the plane. Just you mean like terrorists? Any, terrorists are just assholes, you know, just like people who are dangerous. Well, um, I mean, there, there is that danger, but still, I, I never was afraid of that. I was afraid right. of the actual airplane. Because back then, there wasn't that, right? It was pre... pre yeah, there wasn't much yeah. in the way of terrorism. And, he, and here's a thing, a very interesting thing that he said to me. So the first half's about flying. What do the different dings mean? You know, you're sitting there and you hear, bing, bing. Right. What does that mean? What does it mean when you hear the... Uh, what does everything mean? What does it mean when you see the flaps go up? What does it mean when they... Another thing they teach you is about turbulence. On, pe people who fly don't like turbulence, right? It's right. scary. Turbulence does not make planes fall out of the sky. Right. Turbulence is like a bus going over bumps in a road. Right. They're designed for it. The reason people get hurt in turbulence is people don't put it on their seatbelts and they hit their heads or sometimes people don't stow their luggage well and it falls out. Right. Teach you that. Then he said something very interesting to me, which is, what are you actually afraid of? What's your, what's your actual fantasy? What are you worried about? And there was a flight called Flight 800 that had flown from LaGuardia Airport in New York, where I lived. Mm. And shortly after it left, uh, the nose cone of the plane blew off. Oh, there was an explosion in the fuel tank of, the, of one of the planes. And the nose cone blew off, and I, I was thinking, like, what would that be like? Like, I'd be sitting there on the plane, and all of a sudden, the nose cone would blow off, and I'd see, like, just sky, and then earth circling as the plane was going down, and then either, you know, I, I don't know if I'd be, be not be able to breathe from the plane getting air, the air of the plane getting sucked out, or, and so I continued the whole fantasy, and, said, and he said, and then what? And he said, well, and I said, well, then I die. Then I, you know, <laughs> I hit the ground and I'm dead. They go to the prairie gates. So then he said, so what is the part that frightens you? Is it the dying part? I said, no, it's not the dying part. It's the part, it's the, it's the 30 seconds before. <laughs> it's seeing the nose cone fly off and circling around and getting dizzy and not being able to breathe and knowing that I'm going to die. He said, so that's really the 30 seconds. That's the bad part. And I said, yeah. He said, so let me ask you, are you going to let that 30 seconds, as bad as it is, deprive you of this million dollars that you can get <laughs> this back? Not to say, not to make little light of the 30 seconds, but it's only 30 seconds, right? right. That's the bad part. Right. Then he said, he went into the, all this stuff about how to handle anxiety. And his basic thing was, you observe your own body's reactions. Your heart speeds up, you observe that. Your breathing speeds up, you observe that. Perhaps you sweat, depends what, you know, people are different. You observe, but you observe it with a scientific detachment, if you can. And then he said, look at people on the plane who fly. Look at the stewardesses and see if they look nervous. See if they look That's upset. I do. Right. 
If, he said, if, if we hit turbulence and I'm and I'm like that's, that was a big one, and they're still walking around, I go, oh, it's okay. They don't only walk around; they're laughing. Yeah. I mean, they don't want to hit somebody with a soda. Yeah, yeah. But it's it's a day at the office for them. It's yeah. totally it's totally you're right. So he said, what happens? And this really interests me. Interested me. He said, what happens is with people, if you if you're nervous flying, when anything happens that's out of the ordinary, like there's a bump or a noise. You tell yourself, yeah, yeah, I feel all nervous, so there must be something wrong. And then something happens, and then you can, so it's this cycle of reinforcement mm -hmm. between expecting high vigilance, you know, waiting for something bad to happen, and then you get more nervous. Mm -hmm. He said, look at the people on the plane who work on the plane and see if they look nervous. See if they're like, you know, you can tell. That, and then he said, and this is the last thing I'll say about it. He said, if you can, tell the pilot that you're, that you're nervous. Just tell him if you get a chance to meet him. You know, and he'll talk to you. Hmm. So I, I did, this was, not a, this was a, a chartered flight, but it was a chartered on Japan Airlines. Um, so it was all people from CBS on this flight going to Japan. And Leslie came with me. And I, as I was told to, I had this letter that he gave us to give to the pilot and say, you know, I'm afraid of flying. So I, I gave the letter to the stewardess, but the pilot was busy with whatever the preparations were. So about midway through the trip, the pilot, about six hours in, he comes back. And, you know, the co-pilot is flying the plane. He comes back to see me. And he says, I read the letter. He says, you're Fred? I said, yeah. He said, nice to meet you. He was very sweet. Hmm. He said, let me tell you something funny. <clears throat> He said, I know you're nervous flying, right? I said, yeah. But I said, I feel okay, but I, I, I am nervous flying. He said, you know, I have to get on that mic a couple of times a day. It's part of my job. You know, we pass the Grand Canyon or whatever, and I have to say, if you look to your right, you'll see the Andalusian Islands. You know, this is, this is expected. Right. He said, there's, there's 300 people on this plane. When I have to get on that mic, I, I, I don't like it. He said, when you go on the air, do you go on live? I said, yeah. He said, how often? I said, well, you know, at least two or three times a week. He said, how many people are listening when you go on the air live? 15 million? 11 million? <laughs> he said, you're okay with that? I said, well, I mean, I'm used to it. You know, it's, yeah. uh, it's, I, I know what it's about. I know how to. Yeah. He said, I, when I'm driving this plane, it's like you driving your, your station wagon, taking your kids to school. I know every inch of this plane. I know the noises that it makes. I know the sensations of it. We are totally safe. I'm totally calm. I'm completely in control of this plane. I know everything this plane does. I know it like the back of my hand. When I have to get on that mic and talk to people, I do not like it. <laughs> I'm not allowed to drink because I'm a pilot, but if I could, I'd have a drink before I went on there. He said, you, look how different people are. You go on in front of 11 million people and you say what you have to say. I, I could never do that. When we're playing, it's like I'm watching television at home. I know exactly what to do. I'm careful because I have to be careful, but it, it's, it's, I know how to do it. It's playing in me or one thing. I thought, yeah, isn't that interesting? People are totally different in what they're yeah. you know, afraid of. So then you've been fine ever since? I've been flying ever since. I do, I will admit that when I have to fly somewhere, I take a, a Xanax. Oh, okay. But which, which the guy, which the therapist said, do it absolutely right. have a party <laughs> yeah but you know what half the people on the plane take a xanax so what yeah. i fly last year last summer i made four movies one of which demanded me going to eastern europe one of which demanded me going to canada and i had one i had to go to africa wow. with, if that's with one fucking xanax that's amazing i could never do that before and it's all, the thing I realize is, the problem is, you know, when you don't like flying, you go, those damn airplanes, it's, the problem's not in the airplane. The airplane's fine. It's in your, it's in me. I've never had Zanax. Does it, does it, where, how long does it last? Uh, it lasts about three, four hours. Then what does it make you feel just like more relaxed? It takes away the... It's a wonder drug. It makes you, it, here's what it does. It's, it has the pleasant effects of a drink without any of the drunkenness of a drink. What happens is you just go like, Eh, everything's fine. I don't care. <laughs> but not high. You're not right, high. Right. You're just kind of apathetic. You're, you're not even apathetic. You're like, everything's nice. You're like, this I mean, is nice. The, the bad thing, it has two bad side effects. 
One is, if you're trying to lose weight, it makes you go, oh, I think I'll have a donut. <laughs> It's not like pot where you get hungry. I might be on that all the time then. (laughs) (laughs) It makes you not care. You just don't care. And the other thing is it has a strange anti-memory property where even though you're totally conscious and you feel fine, if I try and remember what happened on the airplane, it's harder for me to remember if I'm taking Xanax than if I were just on medicated. Hmm. But it's not blackout. It's just like like I, I don't. But while you're actually doing it, you feel perfectly well, and you don't feel, at least in the amounts that I take, you do not feel high at all. You just feel like, eh, this is fine. This is not bad. I can go on a plane. Yeah. <laughs> Does it ever wear off, like in the middle of a plane? You're like, oh, my God. <laughs> well, I keep some in my pocket so that it doesn't. If, if yeah. I have a long flight to go on, I take one about an hour. Like Africa is a long flight. That's a long flight. It's no longer than Japan. It wasn't as long as Japan. Really? Did you have a direct flight? No, I had to go to I had to fly to Spain and then from Spain down. Yeah, to I had to go to pa- Paris and then that was the longest day of my life. But from uh, Spain, it was like two and a half hours. It wasn't bad at all. You're lucky. You're lucky. Well, that sounds nice. Well, I also read that you, because of all this, all your all of the adoption and the biological and all that stuff. I guess biologically, are you related to Stella Adler? My true? biological father. Uh, Who's a big teacher, still a big acting teacher. Right. Uh, was related to the Adlers. And he was born in England. He was born in Kent. But when he was a kid, uh, it was during World War II, and he was sent to live in uh, South Africa with his grandmother. Hmm. And he is, uh, how is, and the, the Adlers are a famous theatrical family even long before Stella Adler. Uh, it was Jacob Adler was her father, who was a famous actor from the Yiddish theater. Um, how we, we are related, I don't know, but he told me that we are related to the others. That's funny. Yeah. That's pretty wild. It's in your blood. Yeah, definitely. You know? Seriously. I mean, like, I'm the adopted... Yeah, I should be pr- probably quite a bit better than I am, considering all, all, the, all you, the advantages. That you, <laughs> you have, like, 100 credits on IMDb. Uh, and, and I'm going to let you go soon, but before we do, I know you want to talk about the movie you have coming up um, with uh, Mila Kunis and uh, Kate McKinnon. Yes, that's a movie that opens in August. Um, it's called The Spy Who Dumped Me. Yeah, I love those two girls. Me too. I love them so much. Me too, and we had a really good time making it. Um, and uh, the writer-director is a wonderful... I think of her name. <laughs> I think it's like Susanna. Is that Susanna? Yes. Hold on. Look, you work a lot. Can, you can't we, be expected. We can to cut remember. this out. <laughs> you can't be expected to remember everybody. No, I know her. She's my. I have a real one of the problems with being my age, and also maybe having this brain thing, is that I have a real bad time with with blame, names. Blame the Xanax. <laughs> uh, hold on. All right. Susanna Fogel. Oh, yeah. You, so, you, as, you, I, as I was saying, and you you remembered were, her name and everything. Yeah, I didn't actually. I didn't actually get to the thing. Um, the writer director um, was a woman called Susanna Fogel. She actually co-authored it with a with a man whose name I at the moment I can't remember. <laughs> but uh, she was the sole director, and uh, I really really enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun to Where do. Where was that filmed? That was shot my part. That was shot all over Europe, but my yeah. part of it was shot in Budapest, oh, where crazy. I had never been before, and that was extra interesting because my biological mother's family is Hungarian, hmm. so to go there was and so it's a really cool, beautiful city, um, except that the hotel we were staying at, which is a beautiful, fancy hotel right in the, right on the river. Um, the time that I was staying there, I was only there for about 10 days. Um, uh, the Prime Minister of Israel, Netanyahu, was staying there at the same time. So <laughs> it was like on lockdown. Every time every time you walked in the hotel, you had to be searched. It was really, oh, wow. it was, you know. So it was a combination of beautiful luxury combined with, you know, machine guns in your face all the time. That's so weird. But Budapest is a beautiful city, and uh, it was great to go there. And I really enjoyed doing that movie. How was, who'd you work with mostly? Uh, just the two girls. Just the two girls. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what were they like? I mean, Kate seems like 
she's my favorite person on SNL right now, and she seems like she's just always kind of on. Is she always being funny? No, she's no, a okay. she's a warm, nice, friendly. I mean, she's very funny, yeah. but she's not one of these people who's like you can't turn off. Yeah, she's, she she said very interesting things to me. Like she said, you know, she's not that. She thinks of herself as a sketch comedian, and therefore she doesn't feel all that comfortable doing. Movies, regular movies. Although mm-hmm. she's done several now, yeah. But uh, she was great in it. And Mila, um, who I'd only met one, briefly once before, very briefly, um, was great, lovely, and uh, you know it was it was a really fun uh, experience. And I think because they were getting to play characters that were the central characters in the movie, and it's a, it's a what you might call sort of a female buddy picture. Yeah. Um, and because they were doing it with Susanna, who is uh, you, the, the pr- perspective of the movie is is female, but um, uh, it's very sort of fun loving and interesting. I don't want to tell you too much about it, but what it's about is one of them has a boyfriend um, who suddenly dumps his girlfriend, and they find out that he is being pursued. They find out that he's a spy. And he's being pursued through Europe by enemy agents. So they essentially follow him, and then they become pursued. So they unwittingly become um, operatives or perceived as operatives. Right, right. And I play a guy. I don't. I, I, there's such great surprises in what I do, <laughs> but I play a guy who they believe uh, is a friend of uh, uh, Kate's father's who's going to be a contact for them in in Europe to sort of protect them, help them, but things don't go as they expect, as you might expect. Okay, cool. Yeah, I saw the trailer. It was really good. And I love spy movies, drama or a comedy. I just love spy movies, so I, I can't wait to see it. I haven't seen it yet, but I just saw the parts that I ADR'd, and it looks it looks really good. There's probably going to be a premiere or something. Yeah, there will be. August. It's August. I think it's August 3rd. I'm not positive about that, but there'll be a premiere here in L.A. And the movie comes out when? Probably shortly after that. That week? Yeah, I don't don't know the day. Uh, Well, we will check that out. And as I said, you're going to have to come back because we didn't get the 2% of what I wanted to talk to you about. (laughs) Yeah, I do blather on, but it was a pleasure. I really enjoyed talking to you. I talked about Maria Bamford and Williams, who's a hero of mine. I have lots to talk about, but I'll let you go. And um, uh, thank you so much for your time and being here. And do you have anything you want to plug real quick? Any social media, anything like that, other than the movie? Uh, uh, no, I have four films coming out. They'll be coming out in the next. I'll just say the names of the films. Go ahead. Uh, that one that we already talked about um, is called The Spy Who Dumped Me. Um, I have another one coming out, a collaboration with a guy um, that I love working with uh, called Craig Zoller, an interesting film called Dragged Across Concrete. Uh, um, interesting, uh, ultra-violent, but ultra-brainy Kind of guy. He's the same guy who made Bone Tomahawk. Yeah. Anybody knows that film? uh, Cell Block uh, 99 or whatever that was. Right. Yeah, that was good. Those are good movies. Um, Then another one. too, because you were. Yeah, he puts me in all his films. That's pretty cool. And I have have two other projects coming up with him, but not for a while. One One is a Western, and one is a very interesting kind of AI piece. Dickensian piece, but I'll put those in the future. Uh, the other two films are uh, one that stars your girlfriend, mm-hmm. uh, which I hope will come out uh, Someday. sometime. So <laughs> I hope I don't know what the story is exactly with it, um, but it's called Lake. Silver Lake. Yeah, Martin uh, Star. Yeah, uh, and then the fourth one uh, is called. <laughs> this is terrible. Uh, the fourth one. The fourth one. The fourth one is called Lying and Stealing. Uh, and it stars Emily Ratajkowski right. and, and somebody else. Yes, the guy from Allegiant. <laughs> what is his name? Allegiant. John, hold on. Oh, I don't know. But she's, she's pretty hot. She's very beautiful and also very nice. Interesting person. Yeah. Interesting person. Let me tell you. Uh, let me just look this up. I should, I should have all this at my ready so I don't have to. <laughs> you did too many movies. I keep all this dead air in. Oh no! <laughs> I can't, what's oh, I can't get the Wi-Fi. Can, oh, oh, 
Uh, it's, if, you, if you look it up, it's called Lying and Stealing. All right, I'll, I'll add it, okay? I'll add his name, okay? Yeah, if you don't mind. Yeah, I'll add his name after... Uh, I always do an outro to these, so I'll add his name. Oh, if, great. If, if that works. I appreciate that. Sure, of course. I really I really have a problem with names. It's really embarrassing. <laughs> no, it's not a surprise. I, it happens to me all the time. All right, sir. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Pleasure's all mine. Oh, and, I look uh, forward to seeing you. I'll see you... Probably in, you'll have by the te- next time I talk to you, you'll have like twenty movies that you've done. <laughs> oh, well, from your myth to God's ear, and I want to tell you about my project too, which I didn't yap about. Oh but yes, I yes, of course, that yeah. too. All right, thanks, Fred. All right, thank you very much, EJ. And scene. There you go, folks. That was my talk with the great Fred Melamed, and the name he was looking for was Theo James. Theo James. Theo, you are welcome to come on uh, my podcast anytime. And forget Fred's name. Come on on. Come on. Uh, Thank you so much for listening. And thank you, Fred, for coming on. It was great talking with you. And I hope we can do it again sometime. Uh, So one more time, folks. Check me out on Twitter at EJ Scott and at EJ Podcast. Website EJScott.com. Instagram EJ Scott 1106. My uh, Running Blind documentary on iTunes, Google Play, and Amazon. And to learn more about chroideremia, go to curechm.org. And you can go to ejscott.com. You could also learn uh, more about it there. Please rate and review the podcast. Greatly appreciate that. Subscribe on iTunes and iHeartRadio. Don't miss any future ones. Check out all my past ones. A lot of great people have come on and and said great things. Um, And that'll do it for now. Thank you so much, and we'll see you next time.